you guys. He's like, how do I balance all this? You don't worry about it. So let me ask you something. What if tomorrow morning you woke up to a text that said you got the promotion? But let me describe this promotion. This promotion comes with this hefty compensation package. To start with, you will now move to, you know, Midtown area. You will have a penthouse apartment to live in. You will have a luxury car for every day of the week. And for the days that you don't feel like driving, you will have your own driver. You're like, forget the cars, I'm going with the driver. <laughs> don't worry, it's not an Uber driver. Um, and beyond that, you're now going to be decked out in designer clothes, like Gucci shoes. Like, tell me your designers. Who, who do you, who's your? Who? Louis Vuitton, okay, Louis Vuitton, Chanel, who else, Prada, Prada bags, uh, Chanel, yes, girl, yes, Chanel. So, you know, Versace t-shirts, right? Okay, so this is now your life. Oh, oh wait, I forgot one more thing, there's one more thing. You get a royal spouse. You get to marry into royalty. I mean, like, which one? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> Camilla Park. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, that would be pretty, like, how do you handle all that? How would you be able to handle all that? It's pretty hefty, right? But it actually happened to someone in the Bible, and his name was Joseph. And he got this promotion from prisoner to the second most powerful man in all of Egypt and, and the known world at that time. It was like, boom, baby. And to everybody else that might have just looked at the last episode of his life, they would have thought, this dude is an overnight success. But you and I know different, right? Because for there to be greatness, there also has to be preparedness. And for him to be able to handle everything that came with this promotion, God had to do some things in him to get him ready. And so I think that you know, one of the things that we need to realize is if we want greatness in our life, and can I tell you, God wants greatness for you. In fact, this song that we were singing to him, we don't ever get tired of telling you how worthy you are. I love that song, awesome song. Did you get into the moment of that? But I can tell you that God sings song over, songs over us and in the song, he would switch up the lyrics just a little bit and he would tell you that I never get tired of telling you you are worthy of my love. And I have greatness in store for you. See, I, I really want you to get this, and I love that we are in this series. And Pastor Vance opened it up, and he really, he really opened it up beautifully and opened up our minds to be able to see some things that we didn't see before. But see, as I'm preparing this message, I'm getting really stirred on the inside because there is something on your generation. There's something on you. There's a mantle. You've heard me say this once or twice. But there's a mantle that God wants to put on you. I know that it's crazy right now, and I know it might be difficult for you to have hope for the future, I know that you may have every reason to be jaded and, and just like, what's, you know, so what? Why should I do anything? I'm just going to go to Starbucks. And, or maybe now you found a new coffee place. I don't know. But, but you can't, okay? You cannot give up. Don't you dare give up. Because there's too much greatness that God has prepared for you. 
way too much greatness. Your generation, we just went through this whole thing where we responded to a lot of change, right? It's like it was hitting us right and left. But you got to understand something. You might have been responders to change, but God wants you to be initiators of change, his kind of change. You're going to bring new ways of thinking to the marketplace. You are going to bring new ideas because I believe this is just me, okay? I'm not a prophet. This is just my heart. This is what I think. That God is going to go back to raising up mom and pop organizations and move away from these corporations that pay people enough to be their slaves. I think there are some good corporations out there. They're not all that way. But I see a spirit of entrepreneurship that God wants to put on this generation. And for you to be your own boss, you better learn how to, just like Joseph, you better learn how to carry what you got. And you can't be your own boss if you can't work for anybody else. I'm sorry, I'm going there, and I promised myself I wouldn't meddle. No, I didn't. I knew I would. (laughs) But, all right, let's look at Joseph, okay? I feel like tonight we need to reverse engineer his life because to be able to handle all that greatness, there were some things, right? He had to undergo preparation. So here's what I want to do is I want to just real briefly, I mean, this, this is chapter Genesis chapters 36 through 50. That's a lot of chapters. So I can't read all that to you tonight unless you want to take a nap. But what I'll do instead is I'm just going to do this real quick synopsis, okay? Just to remind you, most of you know the story of Joseph. Who's going, Joseph who? No, okay, never mind. All right, so here, here it is. He starts out as this favored son. He is the favorite son. His dad gives him this coat of many colors, you know, and, and, and he lived a pretty soft life because you have to understand the, the garments that they wore were kind of sleeveless so they could do their work. But Joseph's, this garment went all the way down to the ground and he had these long sleeves because he wasn't doing any work. He was walking around. He was receiving these dreams about what was going to happen to him. They were God-given dreams. But Joseph liked to tell people, guess what I dreamed last night? You were bound down to me. Brother by brother, he went. Do you think that they were all like, that is so awesome, I'm here for that? No, they weren't. The more they watched their father favor the son, the more jealousy came. Because remember, they're not just, some of them were half-brothers, right? And so it wasn't working out too well. And here's what we find is pretty soon, (laughs) cancel culture comes in. You see, it didn't start just with our lifetime. They wanted to kill him, but one brother, one brother, God was looking out for him because one brother says, no, let's not kill him. Let's put him in this pit. In a way, Joseph kind of dug his own pit. And we know what happens. He gets sold. So here's this guy that goes from being privileged to being powerless. And he is forsaken. Maybe you know what it's like to be forsaken. And then he is sold to Potiphar, who's the captain of the guard, super powerful man who takes him into his home. He begins to note that there's something on this kid, that the favor of God is on him, and pretty soon he gets moved and promoted to this position where he's over the whole household. So here he is day to day, commanding things, organizing things. He's, he's just kind of honing his leadership skills. But he runs into Potiphar's wife, who's absolutely a knockdown, gorgeous babe. And she has eyes for him. So she keeps trying to seduce him. But he's like, no way, not going to happen. But so she finally gets angry and accuses him of doing something he never did. And we know what happens. He goes from being entrusted to being incarcerated. And you have to understand at the time, for adultery, 
you got murdered. So once again, God's looking out for him. Instead of being murdered, he goes to prison. And now he knows what it's like to be framed. Something, have you ever had something, somebody frame you for something that you never did? And here you are trying to figure out, how do I get out of this? How do I restore my reputation? And we know that soon as he's thrown into prison, the next encounter is with the prison warden. And again, we see the same theme. They see something on his life. The favor of God is resting on him. He's in this prison with all these prisoners, and soon he is in charge. And it's really interesting because he runs into these two guys, the cupbearer and the baker. Remember them? Okay, they both have this dream one night, same night, and they are like super bummed out about this dream because they don't know what it means. And what's interesting is, you know, he steps into that day and he sees them, he asks them what's going on, they tell the dream. So now he's not just interpreting dreams of his own, he's not just having dreams, he's interpreting dreams. So we see some growth here. Something has happened, and he, and he turns out to be right on with his interpretation. The cupbearer gets restored, and not so good for the baker. And we know that he gave them this request. Don't forget about me when you get restored. But what happened? Yeah, he ghosted him, right? He forgot. This is happens. He's on with his own life until Pharaoh has a dream. And when Pharaoh has a dream, all of a sudden the cupbearer's like, oh, dude, I forgot. There's this guy. He knows how to interpret dreams. Joseph is brought in front of Pharaoh. And now, not only does he interpret the dreams, now he tells him what he should do. Because he tells them there's a famine coming, and I suggest you do this and that and this. I suggest that you get the wisest man to be able to handle this. That's pretty bold for a prisoner to stand in front of Pharaoh and give him advice. Something's happened to Joseph. And Pharaoh's like, you know what? I don't know anybody else. You got the job. That's how his promotion came about. And pretty soon, we know the next encounter happens with his own brothers. And there's a moment where the brothers come, get what they need in the way of food, don't know who he is, and then he finally reveals himself to his brothers. And when the, right after the father is dying, they're afraid now. And they know, <laughs> they know that this could be the end of them. And we really see what happens to Joseph because you have to understand something. He was 17 years old when he was sold. He was 30 years old when he got promoted. That's a long time of mess. But yet things were happening to him. We know that he learned how to endure. We know that he was singing what doesn't kill you, make you stronger way before Kelly Clarkson got the lyrics to that song. And in this moment with his brothers, it's very revealing about who he is and what happened to him. And I want us to open our Bibles to Genesis chapter 50. This is, this is the most poignant statement. He says, but Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done. I'm taking care of the whole world. The saving of many lives. So then, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he assured them and spoke kindly to them. Wait, these are the same brothers that plotted against him? That's what he says. You planned evil against me, but God used those same plans for my good. I mean, sit in that statement for just a minute. That's pretty amazing. 
to have the wherewithal to really say those words. When he was at a point in his life, he could have said anything else he wanted to, and this is what he chose to say. So we're in this series called On Purpose, right? So tonight, here's what I want to talk to you about, and I'm entitling this Living with Great Intent. Because... We're going to have to decide whose intent is going to dominate our lives. Whose intent gets to inform what we think and how we respond. You and I have a choice in that. Because we've been through stuff, we're going to go through stuff, and we need to figure this out because it's a part of our preparedness for greatness. I promise you. So you want to run through this with me? Now, here's the other thing that I, I, I realize as I go through these points. It may, ra- it may poke something. It may raise some questions. And so we want you to be able to ask those questions, okay? We have a format for that. Do we have a format for that? Do they know how to do that? Yep. Okay. Is there something coming up on the screen? Okay. All right, so as you think of those questions, go ahead and write those down and send them to the link. And then before the end of the service, Vance and I are gonna kind of go through these, okay? Because I don't wanna just, I wanna have a conversation. So let's do this, all right? We're gonna use Joseph's story, and I wanna share some of my story, and that's gonna be the backdrop, but I want you to also just kind of put yourself in these scenarios because I think you're gonna identify a lot of similarities. So here we go. Living with great intent. Number one, be willing to be trained as a champion. And the key word here is acceptance. Be willing to be trained as a champion. You see, there's a mindset that has to go with it. This is what I always told my daughter, Lauren, when we were raising her, Lauren, You're a champion, so you get trained differently. There are different choices. There are things that, options that you do not have because you're a champion. Think about anybody that's training for the Olympics. They are not eating at five guys, I guarantee it. Not while they're in training. They're not going and getting the donuts. They're not doing certain things that would hinder their preparation for greatness. So this is what I mean when I say you need to accept it. You need to accept this mindset that goes with it. You know what's interesting is right now, uh, there was a poll that was done recently, and 98% of middle school and high school kids, when they asked them what they wanted to be when they grew up, do you know what they said? They wanted to be an influencer. Oh, dear God. (laughs) For what? I'm sorry. What value are you adding to anybody's life other than making people jealous? And that's not your real life. Anyway, okay. So let me, there you go again. Sorry, I just, not sorry. I I do metal. So that's just, you know me, right? (laughs) So I want you to accept this truth. I want you to own it. And I want you to kind of look at your life through this lens. Because champions are intentional. I want you to sign up and I want you to show up and I want you to stay up even when it gets tough. I want you to stay put in the place that you need to stay put. You see, I believe Joseph had this mentality because they might have ripped off the coat of many colors, but they did not take off his identity. He knew who he was through every single trial, and he kept it. He knew he was a champion, and he kept it. So, you know, if you think about it, the scripture compares our life and our life's work to a race, right? And so there is a preparedness for the race. And one of the things that we have to understand is that our race doesn't look just like here's this pathway and you're gonna run. In real life right now, you know what our race looks like? Our race looks like the hurdle race. (laughs) We don't just have this nice clean go run. No, we jump and jump over this and this and this. 
That's our, that's our race now, right? Is that right? Don't you feel that way? And so, but we can be agile enough to do it. It can be done. There's, there's Olympians that do it. We can do it. We just have to train for it. We have to train as a champion, okay? So I wrote this book called Resilience, and I wrote it during the pandemic. And in fact, there's now a workbook, and we're going to have the book for sale in the cafe afterwards. And if you buy the book, I'm going to give you the workbook, because I know a lot of you are small group leaders, and you can use it for that. But in the book, I talk about what resilience is. Because the reason I know you're a champion and you have greatness on you is because you also have greatness in you. You have this ability to bounce back. Now, if you've ever been to a swimming pool and you've seen a beach ball floating on the pool, what is it about beach balls floating on the pool that people feel tempted to jump upon them and try to submerge them? <laughs> it's, it's gonna be tackled, right? There's innocent, and, and you know, we feel that way like in life sometimes, and there it is. But you know what's gonna happen. I don't care if it's a 400-pound linebacker who has tackled the beach ball. What is going to happen? Who's going to win eventually? The beach ball. Exactly. The beach ball always makes its way to the top because of what's on the inside. It is resilient. It can bounce back. The, the, the ball... Because the ball is forcing the water away from it. The water doesn't like it and pushes the ball back up. So you, you have the same resilience. You might not have much coordination, but you have resilience. Some of you are like, she is so mean. <laughs> but I'm being nice tonight, so. All right. What I want to see in you is a readiness to make your life count. And you understand that you can bounce back, you can come back stronger, and it is inherent in you. And I, I want you to understand that because when I talk about this willingness to be trained as a champion, that willingness is not a passive thing. That willingness gets expressed in looking for ways to improve yourself. What books are you reading right now? Anybody reading a book on leadership? I suggest you do it. In fact, I got one for you. They're going to put it up on the screen in a little bit. You are leaders. You need to learn how to hone your gift. You know, Tiger Woods, this is one of the best books. Take a photo of it. You can go on Amazon and grab it. Intentional Living. This man mentored my husband and I, still does, amazing on leadership. So if you're willing to be trained as a champion, you're ready, you're always looking for ways to improve yourself. You know, Tiger Woods changed his swing coach like five different times over his career because he was always trying to improve himself. If you really believe you're a champion, then you're going to look for ways to educate and improve yourself to raise your IQ, to raise your EQ, all of that good stuff, okay? Now, here's the good thing. You have the right coach. You don't need to change coaches. You just need to be willing to let him train you. Number two, you have to be adaptable. And the key word here is adversity. Because you have to ask this question and begin to look at it this way. What if this present day adversity is here to set you up to win? Now, if you watch the Marvel series, how many of you watch the Marvel series? Okay. And you loved it, right? I mean, the difference between the Marvel series and a Hallmark movie is one has a plot, the other doesn't. <laughs> I mean, here's the thing. Without the battle, there is no winning. There's just Hallmark. We can do better than Hallmark. 
The adversity is how they discovered their superpowers. You're not going to know your superpower unless you face adversity. So you need to start looking at adversity differently. It's here to set me up to win. Because the one who's ultimately setting you up to win is him. Show you his greatness in you in the midst of your adversity, okay? But today, can I tell you, I think we have this a little bit confused. When I talk about being adaptable, in some ways, I think many people, maybe not in this room, but many people, the one who is adaptable is their God. He's kind of small and soft. You know, he's, and you can stick him in your Lululemon pocket. You pull him out when you need him, but he's a small, soft God, so he adapts to your excuses. He adapts to what you like or don't like. If you don't like it, God's telling you to leave. I'm meddling this time for real. He tells you to leave the relationship. He's telling you to leave the church. He's telling you to leave the job because he's a very small, soft God. That's what I mean about confused. Because if you are going to face adversity, you are going to need a rather big God. You are. <laughs> and here's the way it's supposed to work. Remember Plato? The way it's supposed to work is he's the potter and you are the clay. And you adapt to him. You adapt to his word. You are transformed by the renewing of your mind. And you take on the shape of what he wants you to look like. So I suggest you toss your small soft God. You never know what else is going to come flying at you tonight. <laughs> and I suggest you allow him to be the one that is shaping you in the midst of adversity. Because you need superpowers, not super excuses. Because you're not supposed to feel like a failure. You're supposed to feel like a champion. Right. So that's... That's the second point. Number three, whose intentions are shaping you? I'm not on number three yet. I'm still on number two. I haven't preached since October of a year ago, so help me out, okay? <laughs> whose intentions are shaping you? You and I have to live with the greater intents and not the lesser ones. So in other words, people's opinions should not be allowed to diminish you when God is trying to develop you. I can remember in the early days as I'm trying to preach, and it was kind of new then for a woman to be standing up here doing what I'm doing. And I can remember, here I prepared this message, I'm praying, I'm excited, I'm giving the message, and walk, watching people get up, like a row of people, get up and walk out. And they're looking at me like, you should not be doing that. And I'm thinking, you should not be doing that. But I, how am I going to deal with this? How am I going to let that disapproval shape me? Am I going to let it discourage me? Am I going to believe the lie they believe, or am I going to believe the truth of the calling of my, what's on my life? Am I going to think that somehow I'm tainted because I'm a woman and I cannot carry the word of God when Jesus told, chose a woman to carry the very word of God, his son? What, how am I going to look at this? Whose intent am I going to allow to dominate my thinking? And I'm not talking about feminist theology. I'm talking about the pure, unadulterated word of God. You know, that's what I'm talking about here, okay? So I don't confuse anybody. 
Yay, we're fierce. No, I'm not. <laughs> can, we, can we stop being fierce? Thank you. I did tell you it's been a while, so I'm going to keep meddling, apparently. I just decided I cannot control them, but I certainly am not going to let them control me. So we, we have to understand this way about adversity because thumb sucking is for babies. Okay, thumb sucking is for babies. Uh, whose intentions are going to shape you? Adversity can make us stronger. Rejection can make us more accurate to know who we're called to, what we're called to. And remember I told you in that race, you have to jump over hurdles. Sometimes you have to jump over hurdles, H-U-R-T-L-E-S. There's going to be things that hurt you that you're going to have to leap over. And you can do it because you're a champion. Number three, you're gonna to have to be teachable. This, the key word here is attitude, okay? And I love James 4, he says, here's the way God looks at us, whether we are humble or proud. He continues to pour out more and more grace upon us for it says, God resists you when you are proud but continually pours out grace when you are humble. The attitude of humility grants access to some supernatural empowerment. Now, at the beginning, we see that Joseph was rather cocky. And, but we know something happened to him in the process because all of a sudden, over and over, we see this pattern of favor, favor, favor on his life. And grace is much more than God's unmerited favor. It is empoweredness, okay? And it sustains us in difficult situations. Now, I am not proposing you stay in a place where there is abuse happening, but a lot of times we have stretched this definition of abuse beyond where it should be. And we need grace. Instead of saying, Lord, would you take this away? Would you get me out of here? He's saying to us the same thing he says to Paul. My grace is sufficient for you. Honey, my grace is all you need because there's a lot more going on here than I want you to see. Because here's the thing. He says, my grace, my strength, my grace is sufficient and it operates best in your weakness. So let me tell you how that plays out in real life, in work life, because there's gonna be things that you're gonna be called to do that you feel like, I ain't got the goods for this. And all you're looking at is your insufficiencies and your inadequacies. But what he wants you to do is to step into his grace and allow his grace to make up where your weakness is so that you learn how to do this together. Because greatness happens when we learn how to marry our lives to him, our work life, every part of our life. Take Jesus to work with you tomorrow. And see if things don't see if things don't change just a little bit for you. And it helps to wean ourselves off of our own self-sufficiency, okay? It silences the voice of you're not enough. You cannot positive comment your way out of that. You have to tap into the greatness of his empowering grace for that where you are convinced, you know what, Lord, where I'm weak, you're strong. You're gonna show up where I cannot. And he wants that to be real for you. He wants you to taste and see that that is a good thing, okay? And I can tell you, it's amazing how this has shown up in my life. You see, we're called to understand what humility is is. You see, humility isn't thinking smaller of yourself, it's thinking greater about him. That's what, that's, so by comparison, there's a realization. I don't have to rely on myself when I can tap into that. And it helps diminish that 
imposter syndrome thing that says you do not fit here. And you have an answer for it. I am called here. I'm called here. You don't have to fight for it. If you're called for it, stay in it. And when you are there, you are to be a standout. And the reason you're a standout is because you shine. You stand out because you're different. You stand out because you have a servant's heart. Because those who are humble have a servant's heart. They are not afraid of serving other people. Remember, Jesus gets down on his knees and he cleans their filthy feet. There was nothing less of who he was. He was really showing truly who he wants us to be in that moment. And you never know what's going to happen when you shine. Those of you that are in the service industry, how many of you are in the service industry? Okay, perfect. You have a great opportunity to shine. So I remember when I was a waitress in this club, um, not that kind of club. It was more like a country club, businessman's club, right? And I served the lunchtime. And I just kind of went out of my way for my clients. And sometimes what happens is you get regular people who show up every week. And this one gentleman, I had had some conversations with him. He knew a little bit about me. He knew I had an art degree, he knew I had a design degree, but I'm a waitress right now. He called me over one day and he said, you know something, I've observed how you, how you serve. And because of that, I want to give you a freelance job. I mean, he didn't look at my resume. He didn't look, at, he didn't see any of my work. He saw me shine because of the way I served. If you are in the service industry, you have an opportunity to be a standout because there's so many stinking attitudes out there. It doesn't take much for you to look good. And can I tell you, Here's what I learned. When I learned how to be a servant that way and to smile, I actually started liking my job better. I was in a better mood because I put myself in a, I served myself. <laughs> I served myself straight up a good mood. Some of you need to write that down. Number four, be attentive to the author. Okay, key word here is awareness. Your story's already been written down. He's the author and the finisher of your faith. You just don't know it. So then, you ha what, what do I mean by that? Well, what I'm saying is, he's got the story, it's in process, it's working. You have to identify and you have to be attentive to where he is working. And usually where he is working has very much to do with who he's working with and on. See, Joseph got it. He found, here's the key. This was a key moment in his life. It's the time when he is in the prison and he comes upon the cup bearer and the baker. And he looks at them and they're dejected because of that dream. And he looks at them and he says, why are you guys so downcast? I mean, what a stupid question to ask a prisoner. Well, maybe because I'm in prison, you know. But no, he notices something else about them. He notices more than usual they are. Something is in their eyes. There's an expression. He sees where God is working. Because where we say God is working has everything to do with where he wants you to step into the work he's doing. And he didn't miss his moment. And I believe it's quite possible that that's when the shift went from him having dreams to interpreting dreams right then and there because he noticed compassion was working in him. And, and we, I don't care what your profession is, it's really amazing to live an elevated life when you are aware of where the Father is working. How can you be about the Father's business unless you know where he is working? And so I try to live with this attentiveness, like my antennas are out. If I'm grocery shopping, I'm, I'm, I have a few moments as I'm putting my you know, groceries 
on the conveyor belt, especially these days. It's like five things, $500. Okay, that's what it costs these days. But to, to have an exchange of conversation with the person who's ringing me up. Because I don't want to walk out and have missed a moment that I was supposed to have. It just enriches your life. It just speaks to your sense of purpose. So you don't become small-minded that all that matters is my paycheck, and I go home, and I'm going to watch this on TV, and I'm going to answer this text. No, 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 no. Climb out of that. Lift up your head and notice where he is working. Your life will be enriched just by doing that. And you'll get to have these, wow, God, look what we did today. Do you debrief at the end of the day? You need in the process to be able to have, wow, God, look what we did today. He wants you to celebrate the victories that he wants you to be a part of. It's hugely important. It's hugely important. You see, he grabbed that opportunity. He looked around him and he found ways to add value to other people. And that's the best thing we can do any day of the week. And you don't need a title to do that. I mean, to me, the, the more important thing than becoming a discerner of dreams is that he became a discerner of moments. What is God doing right here, right now? What is he doing? And number five, you have to be protective of the dream. The key word here is activate. Now, I'm not referring to this philosophy out there where people are talking about, I'm just gonna manifest this, you know. Okay, people, do you understand there are principles and there are promises, and you have people that are tapping into that on a temporal basis, and they think they got the power you know, what we have is a very generous God. So when I talk about activation, I'm not talking about that mess, okay? I'm talking about keeping the dream alive. Keeping that dream alive, okay? How do you see your life making a difference in the earth? Because that's what's connected to your calling, your purpose, your gifts, your talents. And you're going to run into dream crushers and dream collaborators in the process, so you have to learn how to keep it alive. I can remember when I was in grade school, first grade, I had a nun, went to a Catholic school, who asked me to be a part of this art contest and to do this picture. I painted the picture, and then somehow they lost it, and she wanted me to paint the same thing all over again. And I mean, like, why don't I just paint something else? But as a first grader, I couldn't figure that out. And I remember starting to feel dejected when that was actually a gift God had placed on my life. I can remember also as a junior in high school, I had this teacher, and we, it was a writing class, and I would write papers and submit them, and she would write, you are an idiot at the top of my paper. She would write these things on my paper and give me like a D and don't laugh, but this woman actually had mental illness. That's why she was doing that. You're gonna run into dream crushers and you're gonna run into dream advocates. The next year as a senior in high school, I had taken all the classes I needed to and I had some extra things. I'm like, okay, well, why don't I take creative writing, even though I felt dejected? And I got this teacher who, by my second paper, asked me to stay after class, and I thought, oh boy, here it goes again. And she said, you have a gift. You see, you don't know what people are gonna do. You're gonna run into crushers and advocates, but you better know how to keep the dream alive. You better keep it activated. And you better surround yourself with the kind of people who will help you do that, okay? Number six, be grateful for the dream. Appreciate it. There's, and be grateful for the gift. Be grateful for your life. There's something about the, the power of appreciation that goes far beyond a thank you. It actually fuels your actions. 
It'll serve you well. It served Joseph well. It served him to be able to develop his organizational skills when he was in Potiphar's house. And it served him in another surprising way. It served him from giving in to temptation. Because when this woman is just going after him like crazy, stalking him, he says this to her. He says, you know what? He's put everything else into my hands but you. And I cannot touch you. He appreciated all that he had been given, and it helped him to resist the temptation. And this is why I want to repeat this verse again. It showed up again. The greatest way that this gratitude served him was with his brothers in that moment again. I want to draw us back to this passage. And as we're doing that, like I said, I want to move to some Q&A. So I'm I'm thinking we have some questions and answers. I'm just going to step to the side here, and they're going to bring up another chair so that Vance can come up and join me. But I want us to read this passage one more time. But Joseph said to them in that moment, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. What God intended, what you intended to harm me, God intended for my good. If you could just pull that one sentence from the passage and let, and just brood over that. Let the Holy Spirit open up your understanding to that. It might really serve you in an amazing way. Because there came this point in Joseph's life where he was living the dream, baby, living the dream. (laughs) And I will tell you that I am living the dream. Now notice, I said I'm living the dream. I didn't say I'm living the dream life. Some of you are looking for the dream life. You'll get that. Same time you get a new body. See, there's a difference between living the dream life and living the dream out. Here, you get to live the dream out. So do it well. Amen. Are you guys grateful for Pastor Colleen? Thank you so much. Man. Well, as you mentioned, we definitely got questions rolling in. Awesome, awesome. And so uh, people have been submitting them. I want to turn this way so I can see everybody. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to turn my back to you. Uh, First of all, thank you for even creating this time and space to answer questions. I think that's really, really cool. Uh, I think you've prompted a lot of thoughts for us, especially as we're talking about purpose. And I just want to kick it off with, I think, probably the most prominent question, which a lot of us are wondering. Uh, You mentioned Joseph seeing his life's purpose uh, in a dream. Right. Uh, But we don't all have dreams. And we've gotten several, we've gotten several questions that are hovering around this idea of how do you find your purpose uh, if you haven't seen it in a dream? Yeah. No, that's great. I didn't get mine in a dream either. You know, most of us don't. So um, uh, that was the vehicle through which Joseph saw his dreams because that was a part of his gifting too. So it kind of makes sense, right? But when we talk about purpose, you know, purpose is the overarching thing of your life. It's why you're here, why he gave you breath so that you would know what it means to be loved by him, that you would love him intently, that you would represent him so well that it would be either easy for others to find him in you. That's how we lead people to to Jesus. We look like him so much that we make them jealous or curious, okay? So that's our purpose. Every single one of us is to add to the kingdom, okay? That's your purpose. Now, your calling and your gifts are connected to it, but that's the vehicle 
by which you will carry out the Father's business. In the midst of things, you know, you will use that, okay? So, and, and how do you know what your callings and gifts are? Well, I will tell you that other people around you have already noticed it. And I don't think it's that you don't know what it is. I think you might not wonder if it's good enough. That's good. That help you? <laughs> your, your occupation, your occupation is not the thing, okay? It's how you represent Jesus that's the thing. When we are in heaven, we are going to be shocked at the people who are in the front of the line and the people that are in the back of the line. Mm. We really are. We really are. I mean, I can tell you, okay, so my daughter went to Providence for kindergarten through ninth grade. There was a man there named Mr. Lessie. Mr. Lessie is one of the most amazing people I have ever met. And can I tell you what his occupation is? He is the school janitor. He knows every one of those students' names. When my daughter graduated, she got a note from Mr. Lessie. You see, Mr. Lessie saw that his purpose was greater than cleaning toilets. And he impacted hundreds and thousands of students' lives over the years. So don't worry about your occupation. Now, you've been given a gift, but you better hone it and stop comparing it to other people. Because here's the thing, God is going to put you around people who are similar in your gifts so that you can learn from them, not so that you can be intimidated by them. Wow. That's good. You can't learn from somebody who's intimidating to you. You're just going to shrink. Okay? So ask other people, what is it that you think, what value do I bring? Where do, you think, where do you see me adding value? That's a great question to ask people. And they'll be able to tell you. So I don't think, again, I don't think it's that you don't know what it is. I don't know that you know the value of what you have is. And I want to encourage you. It's valuable. So hone it. Do the hard work. Do the hard work. Read books about it. You know, when I graduated from the Art Institute of Pittsburgh, I had a design degree. But it was a degree I really honestly couldn't have done a whole lot with. I could have designed dresses, I could have... But I decided that I wouldn't just depend on that, and I began to teach myself advertising and marketing. And I started my own cute little advertising agency. So, you know, and, and it morphed into other things. You look at this building, this building... And everything that you see is because of the training that I got, but the extra training that I added. I learned how to do all of this. So my, finally, my career paid off by saving money that we didn't have to hire a designer. And wow. creating spaces became something as a result of it. So I want you to reverse engineer this thought, okay? I want you to think, how is what I have going to add value to other people's lives? And then you go from there because that'll give you the hunger and the faith to be able to press in and do the hard work. Okay? Good. I love that. Thank you. Um, some of the other questions were revolving around uh, what you mentioned about dream crushers. Ugh. And so you talked yeah. about advocates and dream crushers, and that seemed to strike a chord. And so... Um, they revolve around this idea of how to respond when your boss is a dream crusher, when you live with a dream crusher, and one person even saying they feel like they're their own dream crusher. Wow, okay, let's start with number three and work back. Stop that. Okay, that's the answer to number three. <laughs> okay, why are you crushing your dream? What you do, remember I talked about thanking God Gratitude. Gratitude will stop you from crushing your own dream. Amen. Mm. Turn it into gratitude. And write it down. Make it, a, make it a part of your life. As far as living with a dream crusher, I mean, that, I don't know the specifics of that, 
that if, if you need marriage counseling, I mean, I don't know who's crushing your dream. Uh, if you are in a situation where, and you know, sometimes it's parents who do it, um, and they do it because they aren't happy with where they were in life and where they are in life. And so it's kind of this weird thing where they want you to be, do it for them. They want to be able to live vicariously through you and, and they have good intent and horrible execution. Mm. So if it's a parent, if it's somebody that's an authority figure in your life, I would say to them, not right after they make a statement, but I'd leave some space and I'd go to them and say, you know what? I believe that you want the best for me. I believe that you believe in me. There are sometimes, though, some things that you say don't line up to make me feel that way. In fact, it seems the opposite. Like when you said, and give them the statement they made. When you said this, what did you, how did you want me to respond to that? What were you hoping to accomplish with that? Because it's so important to not come at people accusational who are repeating patterns of unhealthiness. The way to help them is to reflect it back to them so they can see it in a different light. You know, I love that the Asian community has this thing about saving face. When you give somebody an opportunity to restate and save face, You've helped them towards health. You've helped them towards health. So what is it you really want to say to me, Mom? What is it you really believe about me? Get them to say life and not death because they need to say it. They need to hear them say it as much as you. Does that make sense? Wow, that is really good. And I mean, Sometimes you're right, bosses can be dream crushers. But you know something I remember, okay, so one of the bosses I worked for, and this was a large travel agency, this was a very difficult man. Oh my gosh, was he difficult. He, he came towards the office, you know, and everybody would be like, run, you know, you know the devil wears Prada? It's like, kind of like that. Okay, he, and so anyway, there's this whole long story about that, but I am his sales exec. Uh, there were two, one guy left, same reason why, now it's just me. And I had this idea that I thought was a really killer idea, and so I presented it to him, and he's like, no, that's not gonna work, that's ridiculous, that's da 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 da. And I remember walking away and just like, man, that, no, that's a good idea. And I had bounced it off a couple people, and I just, I had the whole thing, I had the vision for it. And so I came back to him, and I, this time, I laid out my points. I thought, I'm not gonna give up this easy because I have this vision. This is not just my idea, this is a good vision. So I laid it all out, I met with him again, and I said, look, I just want you to reconsider this one more time because I think this is excellent for the company. So we discussed it, went through a point, and he, and he leans back in his chair and he says, okay, I just wanted to see if you really believed in it. Mm. Wow. You don't know what he's thinking or she's thinking. Mm. And can I just say, if you have a dream, if you have an idea, if you have a vision that needs to be executed and you believe it's from God, do not give up so easily. Yeah. Mm. Because what's the worst thing that's gonna happen? Another no? Yeah, that's the worst thing that's gonna happen. Mm. So don't give up so easily. Sometimes they're just trying you out. Mm. That's a good story. Speaking of which, because you're, you're talking about confidence there, which I feel yeah. like is connected to the next yeah, question yeah. I was going to highlight. Yeah. Um, you talked about having a champion mindset, and then you also talked about God favoring the humble. Yes. Somebody asked a question about how to navigate those two. Oh, so how good. do you navigate the balance between confidence and a championship mindset and humility? Yeah, so good, so good. Yeah, and humility is a really tricky thing to figure out. And you know why it's tricky is because a lot of us have first believed this whole, what we believe about humility is false humility. Mm. And so it, that's why we're like a little confused mm. and it takes a minute for us to get clarity on humility. Mm. Humility is about putting you in your place. Mm. 
But the thing is where your place is. Your place is never under anybody's feet. Mm. Your place is never to be a doormat. Mm. Your place is to be a servant. Mm. You offer yourself. Mm. You're in control. Mm. Nobody's taking anything from you. Mm. You're giving it. Mm. That's really good. Now, this little bit will prevent road rage on 85. Mm. Mm. <laughs> I'm serious. Like, I remember this dude, man, shadowing me. What is that called when they just tailgating, but when they're riding you, uh, there's a name. Anyway, whatever. <laughs> it's a racing car thing. Anyway, drafting. That's what they were doing. And oh, wow. he got so close. And I'm, I'm just like, dude, get off my tail. And then he zips out and passes me over. And, and then he cuts in front of me to make his point. Mm. And at first I'm like, mm. <laughs> there were no digits that went up. Um, <laughs> I, said, I said, you know what, Fred? You didn't take nothing from me. I give you that. Mm. 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 <laughs> so, no, that's good. Humility can have a sense of humor. Humility is um, that you understand the greatness of your God so that you want to stick close to Him. Mm. And the confidence comes from knowing His voice. You see, it's when you get the, the download from Him about certain things. And, but you have to train yourself to know his voice in order to know it's him. Mm. And so that confidence isn't in my own strength. It's in my big God and how I get to do life with him. Mm. I mean, I got to tell you, there's no way my husband and I could have done 30 plus years of ministry and done what we've done. There's no way. I mean, we saw the end of our gifts. <laughs> We're like, if only they knew. <laughs> and our abilities. We, we meet a lot, of, a lot of people who are a lot sharper than us. And they're on our staff. <laughs> but, you know, the thing is that it frees you up to be a person of humility. I know, what, I know where my limitations are. I just don't let them limit me. That's good. But I'm aware of them. I, I, I'm not, I don't have a false understanding of them. But I also know how God shows up in the midst where I'm weak, he's strong. Mm. And so that's, does that, does that help you? And then confidence comes out of that. That's, it's, it's a settledness and a knowingness of this partnership mm. that makes you feel different about yourself and your opportunities. Mm. Okay? It, it's not brashness. It's boldness. That's different, good. Different. Okay. True humility. Yeah. That's what true humility is. Man, that's powerful. Speaking of humility, I feel like all these questions are kind of flowing into each other um, in, in a different way. A lot of people are asking, uh, they're concerned about their finances. Oh, my. And I'm getting different, different questions, but all around this idea. And they're kind of hovering around this idea of, uh, one, it's kind of a two-pronged question. One, does following God uh, mean you are not going to be able to flourish financially? And then the other side of that is, if they're struggling financially, does that mean they're missing God and mm. what he's calling them to at the time? So I think that's a rather, let's talk, start with the second half of that. To say, I'm missing God, like you're missing God about something, but you're not like missing God, okay? I think we just kind of get a little dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> Can we just like, <laughs> this thing, this space, this spot, this thing. Um, and understand that there's other things that where you are flourishing. So where are you flourishing? If you are flourishing in your relationship with him, it's your day starts out differently. Yeah. And you've got to learn to find a way for your soul to flourish for everything else in your life to flourish. Mm. Okay? Because John says, you know, I wish that you would prosper and be in health even as your 
soul prosperous. Right. Good. They know this. Hey, you teach them the word in here. They know. They know the pastor. Learn from the best. All right. Yes. Yes. You do have the best here in, in them, don't you? <laughs> don't you guys appreciate them? So I would say, I mean, there's a reality of, of where we are right now with the economy, all of that. But, but don't let it take your eyes off of that principle and that truth that I just quoted you. Find this way for your soul to flourish. And, and can I tell you, it starts in the, the moment you open your eyes. If you can discipline yourself to make your first thoughts go to him and not your cell phone and see who liked your Instagram post, Nobody doesn't in here. Okay, I knew I was talking the wrong cause. So if you can discipline yourself when you wake up, my, I, I, and it takes a while to do it, so be patient, but when I wake up, my first thought is, hello, God. Hello, Father. I mean, just, he wants us to have this relationship. Bam, my first thoughts go to him. Because that's where it has to start. Because here's what I know. If I don't start thinking about him and just kind of having this little conversation with him, then the other things will come flooding in and he doesn't get to be first. Mm. But learning how to make him first, he says, seek me and finish the scripture. What's it say? All things will be added to you. So if we really believe that we're not called to strive, we're called to be added to, then we back up and we act out differently. Mm. So in this day, I mean, I would love to do a whole practical thing on finances, but I'm probably not your girl to do that. But, but what I wanna do is to tell you that in this day when this is being tested, you need to be rooted and grounded in the truth of those passages. <coughs> Like, I would write them on my bathroom mirror. I would quote them, and I would say, this is what I believe, and so I'm pursuing you. I'm pursuing you. And that is an essential part of it. Obviously, there's practical things that you can do regarding your finances is, hey, would you be willing to share an apartment with somebody? We're so much, we're so independent. And, you know, sometimes I wonder if some of this living by myself puts off marriage because you don't know how to live with anybody. Mm. I don't know. That's just my thought. <laughs> Am I meddling again? <laughs> that is good. That's really rich. All of these answers, thank you so much. These have been really, really rich. I'm not totally done. I just wanted to say thank you. I wanted to ask one more question. Um, somebody asked a question that I thought would be great to leave off on, on kind of the other side, we talked about the dream crushers, but being a dream advocate, mm. uh, how do they ask specifically, how do you steward the dream advocate position? Well, or some tips of being a good leader in that regard. Who asked that question? Ooh. I really like you. You're amazing. That's Sasha. She's a great leader of ours. Oh my gosh. Stand up, stand up. We need to okay. applaud her. Come on. Stand up, Sasha. There we go. <laughs> that's awesome wow to even think that way is amazing okay and here's the thing i think we all need to think that way we all need to be and and now when we talk about dreams uh they can't be daydreams like you know you are not the next michael jordan okay <laughs> not gonna happen so uh <laughs> I'm not talking about placating nonsense. I'm talking about, you know, really being an advocate for somebody else's dream and, and tell them the best thing you can do is to, I mean, there, it's one thing to compliment. It's, one, it's another thing to encourage, okay? If you, want to comp, if you want to compliment, you talk about somebody's shoes. If you want to encourage, talk about their life. And you say things like, Here's what I see in you. Here's how your gift is benefiting me. Here's how your gift is benefiting others. Because sometimes in the midst of us doing what we do and having our gifts, we, we're so used to having it, we don't necessarily see the value of it till somebody else points it out. 
So I think that's, if you can just do that one simple thing, that's a great way to be a dream advocate, to, to let somebody see and know the value of what they have and what they're doing with their life. Love that. Great question. You guys grateful? Yeah. We are so thankful for everything that you've shared tonight. I just have one last request. If you would just pray a blessing. Oh, I would love to. Over us. You guys have been so attentive and so wonderful. I have just totally enjoyed being with you. And I hope that I've added value to you. Definitely. All right. Let mama pray. Thank you, Lord. God, there's, there is a truth to this greatness. <laughs> there is a truth to this mantle that you want to put on this beautiful young generation. <laughs> and I, I want them to be able to see that any adversity they're facing is setting them up to win, setting them up to discover the superpower of who you are in their life. Lord, can we just go home tonight with having this glimpse into Joseph's life and can we lay the template of our own life on it to see the similarities that we would become people who are grateful for what you've given us that we would be willing to be trained as a champion that we would see ourselves and identify ourselves as champions Lord that we would understand and know where you are working, that we would not miss those opportunities. Lord, I thank you for the grace, that beautiful, empowering ability that you've given us. And here's what we know about humility. We know that humility is the most difficult thing to put on, but it's the most attractive thing to wear because it will draw others to us. So my prayer is, Lord, that this precious group of young people will shine for you, that they'll clothe themselves in humility, that they'll be stands out, stand out in their jobs, and that they will seize the moment to be able to add value to others, that they see themselves outside of small-mindedness and fully in the revelation of who you want them to be. Let the eyes of their understanding be open to know the hope of your glory and what is in the inheritance of the saints. What Paul prayed, I pray over them for your glory and for your delight, Jesus. And everybody that agrees says, amen. God bless you. I love you guys. <laughs>